Hello, David Zeritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. The crew is back. And better than ever. The four horsemen. <laughs> I feel like that. We've got Ray. We've got Kyle. We've got Joe. Gentlemen, thanks for coming back. Thank you. Uh, being really brave and for not changing your outfits except for you. Yeah, well. <laughs> this is what we wear every single day with like right. Einstein. Same <laughs> thing at the closet. But this is a tough one. This is, I think this is going to be a controversial. Um, it could get a little rough. Could get a little blunt instrumenty. All right. Uh, hashtag patent pending. But this is the premise. Each one of us has picked what we call an underdog Bond movie. In other words, it's not a Bond movie that everybody gravitates to and says it's in the top five. It's not one of the hollowed ground gold fingers of the world or even the Casino Royale, but it's one we have particular love and passion for for some reason. And you know what? We're willing to defend it. And that's exactly what we're doing today. Each one of us has chosen a Bond underdog film and we are going to defend it. And the bravest man in the room, unbeknownst <laughs> to him, is the one going first because we're sitting in front of Octopussy. So who chose Octopussy? Thank you, guys. Oh! <laughs> what a surprise. <laughs> what a shocker. I stand right now. Well, Joe, we're going to let you kind of lead this, but, I mean, why why Octopussy? Uh, I, yeah, well, so everybody probably knows. I have, I, have, I have had a love affair with Octopussy pretty much since the time I saw it. That doesn't mean Maud Adams, by the way. You mean it doesn't, it doesn't, um, love But affair. it doesn't not mean Maud Adams. It doesn't oh. not mean Maud Adams. Or, or Christina Wayborn either. Yeah. Uh, or, or Bianca from the pre-titles, who, <laughs> who I just found out recently was shockingly young in, in the, make, the making of that film. How old was she? Uh, I believe she wasn't even 18 yet. No! Oh. So, yeah. Yeah! So, uh, but that aside, uh, first one I saw in the theater, I was 13 years old. Uh, and it wasn't even so much the theater experience that really hooked me, but it was it was once it came out later, and it was on cable, and it was playing at nauseum on TV, and I was just in my summer vacation home stuck doing nothing. That anytime that was on TV, this is what I was doing. I'm watching that, um, and and I still to this day, you know, I, I do ask myself sometimes: Am I? Am I? Is there too much nostalgia glasses as I rewatch this film? Is it that? I go, no, I don't think so. I mean, this film to me really does have everything. It's got all of the elements of a great James Bond film and in the right proportions. Um, you know, basically things that you see sometimes a little bits of in other films because they're kind of busy doing everything, but they try to put some Bond elements in here. This one, I, I think, just gets the cocktail perfectly. Um, and there's so many different things, you know, I could say about it, but I'll leave a little air in the room okay. for everybody to, to, to join in the conversation. But yeah, no, I, I think it, it, it's it's a very often misunderstood. I think a lot of fans get it, um, but when you see a lot of like non-Bond fans, like just kind of run-of-the-mill movie yeah. guys, they always rank it really low because I don't think they get it. Mm. It's interesting. So that's his opening statement. We're each going to have one. And then it's sort of our job to kind of poke holes and, and possibly even support what he's saying. So I'll start off. Um, I think that the where a lot of people go with Octopussy is for some reason, it could be the clown, it could be, you know, the horse's ass opening up and the PTS to <laughs> let out. It, it's a bit jokey. It's a bit Roger Moore kind of, you know, arched eyebrow, mm. which again, a lot of fans like, but do you think that's a part of why it gets a little knocks? I, I do think that's part of it. I think that's that's kind of a little too easy, though. I kind of feel like it's an easy shot. Um, there are so moments... what was I got? <laughs> <laughs> easy shot. It's, um, th there are moments in there. You know, there's a lot of a lot of times when you're trying to put some comedy in your movie. Uh, comedy is good, but we don't really want gags. You know, and, and there are some moments in here that I think do fall under the gag category, particularly. The Tarzan swing. I mean, it's the moment we all kind of go like, oh, mm -hmm. we, yeah, I wish we could have just edited that out. Um, <laughs> Sit! <laughs> so, yeah, little, little things like that that kind of make you go, oh, yeah, could have done without that. Um, there are other moments in the film that I kind of feel like are intentionally a little whimsical. Like you mentioned, like the, the, the horse's ass going up. I kind of felt like that was a really cool kind of when you want the first thing you watched it, you're kind of like, oh, wow. Like, I, you know, just didn't see that coming, mm -hmm. really. A um, couple other things. The clown suit does not bother me even the slightest. He is, he's 
not only is he undercover, like, and, and you know, deep undercover, where, I mean, he's literally being chased around by the cops, right? So it's not like he's, you know, he's not just James St. John Smythe just kind of walking in, just, just changes his name, and that's all he needs to do. He's literally hiding, how can I hide my appearance? Um, and that adds to the tension that no one takes him seriously as there is a ticking bomb ready to go off. The, the, the clock is, is ticking down, and it is it ends up being a very intense moment. And I kind of feel like you don't get a lot of that in James Bond films. I think that is a, an incredibly... Um, not only that, but the mystery is also coming together at that moment because it opened with another double O being chased, dressed as a clown. We don't know why this why this happens. This sheds light on that. This mm. is this is sort of where that other agent mm. sort of found Pretty himself, good. you know. So so the mystery is coming together right as the entire plot is coming together in a ticking clock moment. Um, I, I think it's one of the most underrated moments in the franchise. Wow. I think everything wow. just damn. Wow. Yeah. Take Zoom. that. <laughs> Take that, anybody. First of all, man. does anybody want to dispute? Does anybody want to knock holes? I, I was going to say that I was one of those fans that knocked it for those exact reasons. A um, little too hokey. But, I mean, as a kid, I liked that. As I got older, I liked the more mature, more action-oriented stuff. But after hearing that, now i got to revisit it. <laughs> yeah. I made a convert already. Well, it, it's not bad because one of the things I have said about this film, and at first I had poked holes at this, is that this is the one Bond. Um, you've ever seen Master of Disguise with Dana Carvey? Yeah, you know, unfortunately. Where he's like, turtle, turtle, turtle. <laughs> yeah. This is the Master of Disguise Bond film. Yeah. Because in the PTS, you know, he's a Toro. Oh, you're a Toro too. Mm -hmm. You know, he's in disguise. He's a knife thrower. He's a circus worker. Yep. He's a, he's a monkey. Yep. <laughs> I mean, he's a monkey. Yeah. He's a clown. Yep. Uh, he he goes and he's um, even at the auction. He's you know somebody pretending yep. to be yep. somebody else. Dead body. He's a dead body. He's oh, yep. that's right. Yep. He's Good. constantly pretending to be somebody else. So there, it is kind of an interesting master of disguise espionage mm -hmm. Bond film. Yeah. And, and again, you, you it's one of those things I think we take for granted that that happens all the time in James Bond movies, but you, then you realize, not really as much. Yeah. Not as much. And another, speaking of that, you're just reminding me of something else. We always tend to think of James Bond as being um, espionage, you know, international spy things. Um, I kind of feel like the presence of the, the Russians as the bad guys in this one, that's one of those things where I, I get, we, we think of Bond as being sort of like always fighting the Cold War, here he's actually doing it, right. you know? A lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the um, the Fleming novels, he would sort of go after, you know, international uh, people. Um, in the films, I, I think we were kind of nervous to do that, so we tended to lean more on Spectre or just megalomaniacal villains. Here we got actual espionage. We mm -hmm. really have a spy who's going up against, the, uh, you know, uh, granted a, a Russian general who's, who's doing things he's not supposed, he's not sanctioned in doing, but still, you're, you're, you're going after somebody who has international interests to, you know, to take our country down and, and bring their country forward. Um, so, yeah, I think that's another one that is very underrated as well. That's why I like it. I'm, I'm a fan of this movie, too, for those reasons, because it is a tight Cold War thriller with a mystery that unfolds as you watch it, rather than the audience knowing what happens and Bond is figuring it out as he goes. We're figuring out what's happening along with Bond and having Vladimir Putin as a James Bond villain is also really fun. Dude, what, yeah. what, what, what dings do you hear though? Even as a fan, what dings do you hear about? Um, I, I will say that this movie is probably the pinnacle of the gag humor. This is where they do a lot of those kind of like family guy style visual <laughs> jokes as opposed to witty dialogue or uh, subtle humor that you would see in some of the earlier films. I'll say that also the demise of the main bad guy, which I actually like and he's got some really good lines. Mm. Yeah, um, I think he's it just, it's a little quick and wonky. I mean, it's just like, ah, and then boom, yeah, yeah, mm, right. fiery <laughs> burst. It's like a yeah. little unsatisfactory. Yeah. I, I think I've heard that the, um, the actual filming of the plane crash was obviously done with miniatures. Um, and it, it didn't go off as well. Oh. That's why it's it's a little kind of like the carrot seems like it's in the wrong place. Yeah. Um, so the, yeah, that, I think that that explains that. It doesn't forgive it, but it ex explains it. 
Um, but yeah, and, and yeah, I, it is again, it is gag heavy. Well, I won't even say it's gag heavy because I kind of feel like a lot of those gags are really sort of concentrated in, in, in one area. But it is sort of mm. one of those, like, once you see them, you can't unsee them. Mm, right. and, and it does cast a big shadow, unfortunately. I will say this. It is very Roger Moore embraced. Mm -hmm. Like, the only actor that I think could have done Octopussy is Roger Moore. Yeah. Where sometimes we like to play the game of, well, could Timothy Dalton have done Octopussy? And I'm like, I, I don't <laughs> know. It would have been an interesting thing he, to see. He could have done the story, I think, of Octopussy, but they could, he couldn't have pulled off the Octopussy humor. And and even the romance, I'll say, because I do mm. like the interaction between Bond and Octopussy. Absolutely. I mean, it's very believable, and I think Roger Moore's charming, you know, even with the women, where Timothy Dalton's a little bit more caustic and abrupt with women. I would agree. I think Octopussy is Roger Moore's greatest uh, leading lady. They're the one yeah. whose relationship I buy the most. I think she's a phenomenal Bond girl. Top five. Whoa, even more than Vesper. Well, for Roger Moore. She's, oh, for Roger Moore. Yeah. Yeah. But she's but she's a top five Bond girl, without a doubt. I like it. Well, Joe, you did a great job defending. We want to keep these snackable and bite size. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, the, the thing that it was is I don't think any of us were vehemently against Octopussy. It's grown on me. To me, I think it's, a, I'll, I'll say it, it's a grower, not a shower for me. <laughs> I've grown to like it over time. Uh, people like you, Calvin, um, Ellis, you know, just people in my life have told me to go rewatch it. And I, the last few times I've watched it, I've had nothing but smile from beginning to end. Yeah. And um, I'm going to take a Kyleism. He doesn't die in the end. He gets the girl. There's no kids. He's not making crepes. Um, there's, there's a lot of good things. The bad guy's pretty good. There's actually a story and a plot line that connect. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, so there's that. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think for my next act, I'm going to defend No Time to Die. And, uh... Too difficult. Too difficult. <laughs> but speaking of that, we defend do, again. You mean <laughs> we do have another defense? Let's head over to another movie. Okay, so we are back. We're in front of my license to kill because uh, will the volunteer who is defending license to kill please raise their hand? That would be me. Oh, dear. <laughs> All right, Ray. Opening statement, my friend. All right. License to kill. It gets a lot of slack because of the violence. Uh, Timothy Dalton's hair. <laughs> <laughs> Defend uh, that. <laughs> Guilty. Count Dracula. <laughs> but I, 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 I actually really, really enjoy it. Um, I think it is a precursor to Daniel Craig. Serious film. Sure, it's not Roger Moore, uh, but it's... It's got everything in it. You've got a drug lord, uh, tanker trucks full of cocaine, gasoline. It's a party. Um, <laughs> got... These days, I think the gas is more expensive <laughs> than the cocaine. Yeah, no, very good. Uh, for some reason, Stinger missiles, but still, it, it leads to some really cool action sequences. Uh, Pam, two Bond girls, Pam uh, Bouvier, um, Lupe, uh, pet chameleons, or, or whatever it is. It's yeah. iguana. Uh, <laughs> it's a good time. I really enjoy the movie. Uh, it does get a little bit of slack, but I actually enjoy it. What What have you typically heard it gets dinged on? Ooh, what it gets dinged on? Um, probably the violence the most mm -hmm. uh, for, for that time period, just because, I mean, it, it's that Miami Vice 80s vibe going on the whole time, the whole uh, thing with the drug lords. They also have Wayne Newton as a cult leader. <laughs> but, Bless uh, your heart. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but all of that just, just makes makes it a little more fun on top of all the, uh, the action sequences. But I've always liked the more serious uh, Bond stuff anyway. Yeah, I will say this as a minor defense. Um, I do like the bad guy. I think oh, Sanchez, Sanchez is yeah. unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Uh, Robert Davi knocks it out of the park, and I'd be afraid to say otherwise. Um, anyway, <laughs> but no, he really does. But I will say this. It doesn't look like the sumptuous Bond films that I'm used to. There, there is kind of a 1980s like uh, TV look to it. I, I could see that. Um, it, it definitely draws from a lot of stuff from the 80s. Uh, the bar fight at the um, barrel, the what barrel? Barrel, 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 barrel head. There you go, barrel head. Uh, <laughs> kind of straight out of Roadhouse. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, I could I could I could see that a little bit, but I, it's still a fun romp for me. Mm -hmm. Joe, what do you what do you kind of still let's stay with the dinging things. What would you <laughs> ding it on? <laughs> Well, what I dig it on, well, I, I, you're, I think your point is is very good about uh, that, that it does feel like in like kind of an 80s, 
I, like, I, I feel like I want to see it as sort of an 80s action movie, but I do see it more as 80s action TV. Um, I, I, I've always sort of been distracted by the production value. I feel like it's, it's a very sort of flat uh, looking film. Uh, some of the scenes are kind of awkward. Um, the two scenes with the two Bond girls talking to each other when she says, I love James so much, and she goes, <laughs> like, 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 like a JV varsity cheerleader lately. Like, <laughs> that James, he was, he was with that girl last night. Um, you, know, it's, you know, just kind of like. Fiddlesticks. <laughs> you know, Fully on him. Uh, and, and, you know, and I kind of feel like, like Q is out of place in this film. I kind of feel like they, they really kind of butchered his character a little bit to, to, to kind of wedge him into this film uh, when I feel like this was a was a prime kind of a film where you needed like a Columbo, you know, a Draco, mm -hmm. you know, one of those kind of characters that kind of come in and, and help you out, you, you know, you have mutual interests, etc. Um, and, and that's about it. There's a lot of it, it. It's a hard movie for me to get really into, but I, I do kind of agree it, it does do a lot of things right it is it, you know bond the bond films sort of they do kind of identify with what's happening at the time so they sort of take it takes on different identities at different times and this, this is a good experiment and like well, what would bond as an 80s action film kind of be mm. um so i think in that respect it's pretty good so but it's also not the typical bond film where he's trying to solve something it's a straight revenge story he's yeah. out for blood mm -hmm. yes yes mm. Yes, right, and in that respect, I think the plot and the story is very easy to get into, mm -hmm. because right, because like you said, it, it's it's laid out right in front of you. Here's his goal, and that's what he's doing, and it does provide twists and turns in how he does that, because then it kind of turns into that Rashomon sort of, you know, pitting the two sides against each other, pitting him against his own people. Um, so he changes tactic a little bit. That's that's pretty good. Um, so yeah, don't want to bash on it too much, but <laughs> Kyle Dings. Um, there's a lot I like about this movie, but there's a lot that I think miss the mark. Uh, it, it, for want of a better term, it's, it's the style isn't there. And I don't just mean mm. the James Bond clothing. But that is a part of it. That's a, that's a big piece of it. There's just something missing. It's missing that level of class, that level of polish that you come to expect from a lot of the other films, especially sandwiched in between the Roger Moore and Pierce Brosnan eras we're kind of missing something. We're missing a little bit of that glamour, that little special um, Bond flavor that isn't really there. Part of its clothing, part of its uh, Dalton's hair, but I think there's so, there is something else too. I, I don't know if it's, if it's blocking camera technique. It just, it, it doesn't have the style of some of the other films. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I would ding it on similar things. I mean, for me, it is the worst styled film. Um, I think the best part of this, believe it or not, is Dalton. Mm. I think Dalton mm. still carries it through. With What I love about Dalton in both of his films is he is the same character. You know, even with Craig, I feel like depending on the film, you get a different type of James Bond. Definitely. Certainly if you look at No Time to Die and Casino Royale, it, it, it does. I mean, you call it an evolution. Joe would be in denial if you did that. But I mean, I, I think with Dalton, it's consistency. But my problem is, is the guy who uh, did the director of photography for Lethal Weapon, the music for Lethal Weapon, um, the artwork for Lethal Weapon, the art direction for Lethal Weapon, all worked on this film. And it feels like a Lethal Weapon it does. film slash TV. And because of that, Bond to me always is, is, is a higher, loftier thing. That, the that's look, the colors are richer. Yeah, you know the sounds are better, and this just doesn't feel that way. The locations are are glamorously framed and shot. Other than a few of the places in Mexico City and out in the Mexican desert, you don't really have that in License to Kill. Yeah. Now argue with us, Ray. Tell us we're crazy. You're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's plenty that I can say positively about this film. <laughs> um, I mean. I, I, I understand everything you're saying, and I do agree it does come off as that lethal weapon t style uh, movie, but that that's kind of what they were going for. It's mm. not your typical, you know, romp around the world, um, trying to find the big bad guy with the underground lair. This is a straight revenge story. Yeah. Um, he does have an <clears throat> underground lair. Well, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> touche. Yeah, but it's not straight, it curves. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> um, but I, I, 
the the action sequences itself, uh, I think, in this movie are some of the top tier. Yes, um, I definitely think it has one of the most scary uh, henchmen, um, not just in a James Bond franchise, but in just any movie really. He's a Mario. Yeah. Mario's yeah. just That's a true. nut. He yep. creeps me out. Um, but uh, I like it. <laughs> I, I I will say this. Um, I like Pam. I think she's a fun and good um, Bond girl. Lupe is like Christmas Jones territory. <laughs> She's just, I'm sorry if the actress, she'll never watch this. Um, but she's cringe. Like all of her lines are like, you know, yes, I'm, you know, know somebody on the film or something. I, I just, it's just cringeworthy. And I think whenever I have that situation, especially with, I will say, even with No Time to Die, you have these wonderful actors. Everybody, even in the small roles, they bring their A game. Yeah. She just, she may have brought her A game, but her A game is a D game. <laughs> and, and you get a couple of those moments. Um, it's just bizarre. And then, then there's little moments, even like in, uh, you know, wash, wash the, the laundry, the, uh, you know, when the guy's head laundry explodes head. and oh, stuff yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's a little goofy now. It, it doesn't quite hold up, but... But you have, do you have a nostalgic connection to this? I have to ask. Like, did you see this in a particular important time of your life? Mm, I was five years old so, uh, yes. at the, when it came out. So and that's I'm yes. pretty sure I saw it um, actually like uh, on TV at some point. This movie was on TV in the 90s All the time. constantly. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean... How often do you watch it? Uh, well, at least once a year to get around to it. Nice. It's, it's one Christmas. of the ones... No, not my Christmas show. <laughs> That's the kids went to bed early. Sarah's not feeling good. I'm going to pop in this movie. Um, I really enjoy the... I want to say the, the violence of it because it is, but just the the, the action scenes themselves. Like uh, we had the uh, skiless water skiing scene mm. stunt. That's amazing. Thing. That is yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love that scene. Action, I, action in this movie is very well done. The action's amazing, and even the stunts, like the yeah. tanker thing and stuff like that, as funny and ridiculous as that is. And I, I will say this though: um, first of all, I don't know if it's even being picked up, but there's a chainsaw <laughs> outside as you're talking about this chainsaw film. Chainsaw, my ass! I don't think anybody's ever gonna hear it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're I, I may insert the effect that just, just to make it <laughs> prolific. And Joe, you're a Majesty's fan, so the whole what did you think about the the wedding and the lighter? From Felix uh -oh. and that whole connection, I, and then I, the I drive think, to. I, I'll tell you this: I, I think that the lighter scene, or the lighter as as an element in the film, very underrated. I I, I totally yeah, agree with you I there. The, the fact that this was, and they were even smart enough to do that little bit where he lights it and they kind of jump back for a second because the mm -hmm. flame is too high or whatever. Yeah, right. And then later, that's what he uses. I mean, that that to me that. is brilliant. Me like too. when he shows yeah. him the lighter and yeah. then sets him on fire. Perfect. Like that's poetry to me. I think it really worked really well. Chekhov's lighter. You know, there you go, right? <laughs> what What do you think about uh, twenty seven hours after Felix Leiter's new wife dies, and he's like, "Hey, James, I got a nurse tucking my pillow. What you doing, buddy?" I honestly, and that you know, that's always bothered me, and because I kind of feel like it's it's not it's not just like when the nurse walks in and just fluffs his pillow, and he kind of looks at her and smiles. I kind of feel like it is definitely implied that this is like, oh. she's not just a <laughs> yes. nurse, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. So it's like, like guys, let, let the corpse get cold for us. You know? <laughs> yeah. Those are two things I will ding. I will ding it on myself is um, Felix and the nurse and Bond and the bride. Yeah, too. there was a little. Yes. Oh, oh my god! Right? Yes. I. I mean, honestly, it makes it. You know, and I. I get it that Bond has to be like the leading man. Yeah. He, he's the handsome leading man with all the charisma, so we can't. And Leiter <laughs> has sort of always played that part, frankly, where he's the sort of fuddy duddy who can't quite keep up with James Bond. Doctor No would be the exception there, but. Right. But yeah, so I kind of get it, but boy, this it's almost like. It reads as if they had a relationship, and she couldn't nail down James Bond, so she settled for feelings. <laughs> but she's still taking one more try. And by the way, with this factors back to fans, is uh, Luke Taggart's getting ready, re re ready to wed Brienne, his fiance. Kyle asked to replicate that scene, and, <laughs> and Luke said, "No way, because it's just too damn close." Oh, Brienne would be up for it, I'm sure. Brienne would be up for it, but you know, does Luke want to lose a leg to a shark? Well, probably not. <laughs> I'll see you in hell. See Kyle. you in hell. <laughs> <laughs>
We're having way too much fun. Sanchez. Listen, this is a hard one. I mean, this is a hard one because, you know, it is one of these that I think people do put in their bottom five. But there's a lot to like here. I think there the, is. the plot is fantastic. This is the only time that I like it when Bond goes rogue. This is the time yeah. it works. Yes. Uh, any other time, it's, it's kind of run oh. its course. It's cliche. I'm tired of seeing Bond going rogue. But here it works. And there's not a plot hole to be found here. I agree. It does move along in a okay. Uh, wow. <laughs> let's let's hear. It. Well, I, you know, I, and I don't. I don't mean to. to, to, to I, I I've always felt like, you know, the more I watched it, the more I kind of felt like, and I and I I don't know if I would. Maybe it's not technically a plot hole, but Sanchez, I feel like, is the only guy who doesn't know that James Bond <laughs> is really a secret agent. I feel like with every scene, there's like the, the, the Koreans who are undercover, they know who James Bond is. Um, the, this, the, 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 the side guy, Heller, he was doing deals with Pam, so how yeah. does he not know who the James Bond is? grocery store clerk. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. like, like, every, like Dario is the only other guy yeah. who, who knew that who James Bond was. Finally, he shows, like, you couldn't have called and said, that, you know, there was this guy. He had, a, he, he had brown hair, he had a British accent. If you see a guy like that, you know, no, nothing. So just like, Sanchez, just like, just the only, Lupe knows. I mean, again, everyone around him knows. So so I kind of felt like, I mean, it was like, it, how long did it take you to catch on? And he's, he's not the guy. Okay, so maybe there's a plot hole. <laughs> <laughs> Where he's, like, going to go home and, like, bend that Blu-ray in half. Screw it! But obviously the saving grace of the movie is Timothy Dalton. I mean, yeah. if you look yes. at Timothy yeah. Dalton and Daniel Craig, I think they're like two of the best actors where you can just read the emotion right off the face. Oh, yeah. 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 So when you see yeah. Timothy Dalton and his eyes get all serious, it's chilling. You're, yes. You believe that he's yeah. ready to get revenge for Felix. Yeah. I, I will say, if I'm in the mood for a movie about James Bond, the Dalton ones, you can't go wrong. Because mm. you get James Bond served up on a platter. Mm. It's not distracted. Yeah. Like octopus. <laughs> All right. Well, guess what? That's our time. We're going to give Ray, a, 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 you know, just a little wafting of air so we can go to the next one. And we are heading to the next movie. License to Kill, the leg man's James Bond movie. Oh, I like that. Well done. <laughs> okay, we're back. And everybody kind of do this. Everybody split. No, the other way. Way back there, I swear, is uh, Spectre. And so we're here to talk about Spectre. And, of course... The gentleman defending Spectre, would you please? Yes, there he is. It is me. I, I'm the lucky guy who gets to defend the uh, the redheaded stepchild in the, in the Bond. In the Bond uh, is it is it considered the redheaded stepchild? You know, I think that it has its defenders. There are few and far between people like me who like this film, and then there are a lot of a lot of uh, mostly fans of cinema more than James Bond fans who really don't like this film. Mm. Well, give us your opening statement. Why do you love this film? This is the only time that Daniel Craig plays the James Bond that I grew up watching. This this is Daniel Craig inhabiting the role of James Bond. He's witty, he's flirtatious, he's successful. Um, he He's kind of like a, a stalking predator throughout the whole film and I really like the way he brings James Bond to life here. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, who wants to jump in first? With Dings. We're going to start with Dings. <laughs> oh boy. Where do we, start where, with do, where do we begin? <laughs> Joe, you want to start? <laughs> Uh, wait, wait, did you hear that, ladies and gentlemen? He went... <gasps> <laughs> he's, got, he's got a lot to say. <laughs> let me, let me let me get a running start. Uh, well, I mean, honestly, I, I feel like I get ding this one all day um it it's commence he's gonna do it against he has uh, <laughs> it, 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 yeah i i find this to be a, a very disappointing very i like i like what you said about craig in the film um the the the, the predator stalking his prey i thought nah, that, that that does i i would agree with that i mean he, he's um you know he plays it pretty well no comp complaints there um but again this is the kind of movie like the story is just a lot of breadcrumbs you know and, and i you know, it's, it's it's him just being told about one clue, going to the next one, being told about the next clue, going to that one, um, and just kind of moving forward step by step by step. And and it's not very, I, I don't find it to be an intriguing story. Um, in, in a lot of ways, I would I would call it a very empty story. I got to feel like there's not a lot happening. 
and, and I think one of the reasons, like like License to Kill, I'm a little more likely to to forgive because I feel like it's trying to do a lot of things, maybe just falling short. Spectre, I feel like they're not trying to do very much. And I kind of mm -hmm. feel like th there's a, a, a feeling I get of laziness when they put this together. And I kind of felt like somebody somewhere said, oh, you know, we're going to do the twist. This is sort of a big thing. They they like they will pull out somebody from, you know, from, from the canon from years past, and that'll be the big twist. And everything else will just sort of fall into place. And I'm, I'm like, man, but, but it doesn't just fall into place. You still have to put a film together. Um, so... And I'll agree, there are a lot of story points in this film that I do not like. I, I've yet to meet the fan who likes the idea of giving Blofeld and Bond a shared backstory. Yeah. Whose idea was that? Brofeld. Where did that come from? <laughs> Nobody likes it. It was a terrible, terrible yeah. decision. Yeah. I, I'll go through my list of dings first, because I'm hoping we can round out the 15 minutes with some positives, of course. <laughs> um, but here are a couple of my dings. First of all, coming off of Skyfall, and I have to put that in my mind, coming off of Skyfall, which I absolutely loved. I loved the way it was shot, directed, the way it looked. It felt like a Bond movie, mm. the way I experienced it. Um, even from Mexico City, as much as I love the Mexico City scene, it does have this strange, and we have to talk about it, uric acid, does have that. urine, sepia type tone going through almost the whole thing. <clears throat> and actually, when it doesn't do that, it's almost glaringly obvious that that filter's not there. Mm. So it, first of all, that made me realize that. And even the way it's directed, um, there are some angles and shots, which I'm very conscious of, that are just so jarring. Um, that, and I have to say, my expectations, and this is this is what you do with a Bond fan, you're never going to meet or exceed their expectation because we suck. That's true. <laughs> so going into it, I thought, who was my fantasy Blofeld? And of course, it was Christoph Waltz. And I'm thinking like, this is going to be the best moment of my life seeing yep. this movie. And I saw it and I'm like, they blew it. Do you I, think part of that was marketing when they... they Denied, denied, denied. No, he's not Blofeld. No, he's not Blofeld. No, he's not Blofeld. We swear. Oh, by the way, he's Blofeld. gotcha. <laughs> he's Blofeld. For me, for me, the disappointment wasn't Blofeld. It was actually the movie, even as I see it today. If I watch Spectre today, I just keep shaking my head every time he's on, except for the meteor scene. Mm. And except for the, um, just the little beginning of the meteor scene, and of course, the, the wonderful... Um, uh, committee where they're all meeting at the table. That's his best scene as Blofeld. Because Blofeld should be so disturbing. Everything afterwards, he's this irritating little imp. And they don't give him anything to do. He's not intimidating. He's not scary. He's just strange. And he doesn't. he's not a good Bond foil. And you're coming off of Javier Bardem. Freaking right. mm. Javier Bardem. And we're not seeing him being menacing after that scene in Rome. That's when no. he's really... Scary because I think the character of Blofeld works best when we don't see him, when he's this like shadowy, unseen, malevolent presence, like in From Russia with Love, in Thunderball. That's when he's frightening because we yes. don't know who he is. And motivation. So, just like I have an issue, I'm looking at it right now, and I can see him behind me. The issue I have with Safin is not just because, you know, of Take the a drink of the every movie. time we ding, no time to die. <laughs> I swear we don't work for Tom Cruise and Paramount. I swear we don't. No, but but the, the problem I have with that is the lack of motivation in the story of the bad guy mm. to be the, the the big foil for James Bond. It's the same in this movie. It's like really mm -hmm. because you were jealous of Daddy and now you're the architect of all these things. To me, they were trying to Reddit and just dismiss all the great bad guys that came in the Craig era before that. Le Chief and Harvey R. Bardem, hell, even Dominic Green. You're saying you were the guy behind it? Mm. I'm not buying it. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, I'm going to say it, I'm not buying the romance. Mm. So now you've got all these disconnects of characters. I'm not even talking about gadgets and Bond. Because I think Craig did a great job. Like, people ding him on the whole, you know, that doesn't look good on the phone. <laughs> but I actually like the economy of word Bond as opposed to the soliloquy uh, bond of No Time to Die that goes on for 15 minutes. Mm. What? Oh, I'm happy to see in this movie a return to those tropes. You brought up the gadgets, right. things like that. That's that's what I love. I want to see an Aston Martin. Hold that Martin. watch up. I want to I see a gadget watch. I want to see an Aston Martin that has flamethrowers. I had missed that in Casino Royale through to Skyfall, and it was nice to see a return to some of those things that 
make me excited to go see a James Bond movie rather than just a pedestrian action film. Yeah, good point. But do you also admit that from a character to character standpoint, there are disconnects? Oh, certainly. Like I said, there are some story problems here that, you know, we, we've beaten to death since 2015. Nobody likes Brofeld. Everybody thinks that the romance is rushed. Um, Monica Bellucci is not in it enough, but she's there. She, Monica Bellucci is in a James Bond film. You know How what? exciting is that? What took them so I'm long? I'm sorry. I'm on Kyle's side now. <laughs> Just like that. Monica Bellucci, a couple syllables. What took them so long? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, I got one for you, Kyle. On top right. of the things that these gentlemen already called uh, as a fellow firearms enthusiast, there's a lot of dings going on, Inspector. Ooh. Okay. From the uh, from Leia Sadu's gun handling on the train, Bond, well, actually not her. Yeah, train, what's up Bond's with that? <laughs> uh, Bond handing her a loaded gun, Bond using a 32 caliber pistol in his PPK to take down a helicopter. All right, I got, I've got a retort to that. <laughs> so do I, so do I. Wait, let him, let him go. Because okay. uh, he may have a long list. <laughs> uh, Bond taking everybody out with that uh, AK. I mean, there's a there's a lot of problems with it. Um, Wait, what's the problem with the AK taken out? The, I know what you're talking about. It's uh, almost like a video game, but is that impossible to do? Uh, yeah, it, uh, there's as a firefighter, there's valves on tanks like that to keep them from rupturing that way. They, oh. they vent off. Uh, Bob. So, yeah, that, that, it really wouldn't happen that way. Um, my my excuse for the end scene I've always used is that it's Bond, it's Q Branch. His ammo comes from Q Branch. It could be special ammo. And, and that's kind uh, of what I say. <laughs> he he couldn't shoot because he took a couple of shots with the gun that he took off of a Spectre agent, mm. and that wasn't impactful on the helicopter. But his issued firearm from Q Branch was able to bring the helicopter down. So mm. that's kind of, we're on the same page there. However, I don't think it was handled correctly. Bond picks up a rifle in Q's lab earlier in the movie, yes. looks at it, sights it, checks it out. Q takes it away from him. That should have been on the boat. That should have been the gun Ooh. that he picks up to shoot down the helicopter. Mm. That's a good point. That's freaking genius. I have not heard that yet. Yeah. With a giant thermal scope on it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The other change to your criticism I would have made, just to make it a little bit stronger, Madeline has developed, or she's demonstrated proficiency with firearms on the train. We know she knows how to handle a gun. So Madeline should have picked up the AK and shot their way out of the crater, not Bond. Okay. It's a James Bond movie, damn That's it. not what happened, <laughs> but that would have made it stronger. Okay, <laughs> interesting. What about, I, and I'll just kind of throw it out there further. So it's, you've got Hinks. Mm -hmm. I actually liked Hinks. Mm. So do I. I thought Hinks was fun. He was kind of like a Jaws-like character. And I miss those, those types of characters. I mean... It, Who's the major henchman in Quantum of Solace? Elvis with his bad wig. <laughs> now we've got this guy who's... What is oh, that, a preheat for my session? <laughs> <session? laughs> like, nice. this, this bruiser guy in the vein of Odd Job and Jaws. He's silent, he's deadly, he's brutal. Wow. Um, he's the type of James Bond henchman that we grew up watching and getting a kick out of every time they're on screen. And I have to say... The style and the fashion is unapproachable. Certainly. I, this is, I think, the most stylish Daniel Craig film from a sartorial perspective. I know that doesn't necessarily make a movie stronger, but when a movie looks good, you tend to enjoy it more. Well, I will say we're coming off, hot off, License to Kill, mm -hmm. where that was such a void the look and the feel yeah. and the style, that this is a wonderful palate cleanser and, and, in that regard. And it has that. It has the style. It has that, that special touch of class. If you look at some of the major scenes that were shot in IMAX, like Bond's approach to Austria when he's, he's first sailing oh. to Mr. White's house or the opening tracking shot in Mexico City, it's, it's a visual spectacle. Well, the tracking shot is excellent. But another thing, the lackluster big opening stunt. A helicopter. Mm. With a slide whistle. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it just didn't do it for me. <laughs> Joe, any redeeming values with Inspector? Yes, I, because I, I, I definitely agree with you on Hanks. I thought he was a great henchman. I, I, I totally agree. He was a great re return to form. He was spectacular, and I will leave in. Uh, ding, No Time to Die, which I'm sure everybody will be happy with. Uh, missed opportunity there, not bringing him back in, because he, he could have got his uh, Moonraker treatment, you know, lately, bring him back again, you know, to, to, to keep on going. I think. Put him in a neck brace. 
Yeah. It, something, yeah. I mean, honestly, yeah. He could, he could be something. babysitting at the kid and look at the kid and go, here's to you, kid. <laughs> <laughs> and then eat her for the uh, amniocentesis or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and yeah, stylistically, definitely a win. Um, you know, I, 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 again, too many missed opportunities. I almost feel like I'm like everything yeah. I'd want to want to give it credit for. Then I go, I gotta go, but, but uh, Christoph Waltz, I think was a was a very interesting choice for Blofeld. I don't think he got the treatment that like they, they didn't use him the way he should have been used. I feel like I feel like yeah. Christoph Waltz again. He he's he's brilliant in something like um, uh, glorious Inglorious Bastards because he's he puts on a nice face and a nice smile but he's capable of of committing horrible acts yeah. um he he's not doing the horrible acts here so he's just mm. kind of the smiley face without the umph behind him and and it, it's a big mistake again he, he's the leader like you said he the whole reason that he's he's such a, a menace he's mysterious he's got this whole conglomerate behind him but at the end it's just him and his helicopter pilot by themselves and he gets taken out because he's all by himself. It's like, no, your whole, the whole reason you're powerful is because you don't do stuff like that. Mm, and it's, yeah. Um, but yeah, but I mean, there are a lot of redeemable things. It, it's, it's not a terrible watch because again, it does have, um, a couple of visual, uh, treats to it. And there, there are a couple of good moments, I think. I'll tell you what, from a bad guy standpoint, a bad guy who kind of is a little bit affable. Um, I think the Mr. White scene is probably one of the best scenes with Bond and somebody else mm. in, like like so in the well Craig era, scene. it's so well done and so interesting, and and I don't know, I, there's, there's a certain suspense to it. Uh, I could watch that over and over again. And it it makes Mister White the most important figure in the Daniel Craig arc, yeah. Because mm -hmm. every single film has some sort of repercussions from Mister White's actions. That's a great point. Even much more than Vesper, who they try to force fit yes. into every yeah. film, including No Time to Die. <laughs> um, but it's it's not as successful as the Mr. Wayne. Moments. That's true. He he's the most significant figure in that Daniel Craig story arc. Where does Spectre fall for you in the Craig continuum? Uh, I put it at number two below Casino Royale. Casino Royale mm -hmm. is just uh, everybody loves it. It's brilliant. It's a perfect modernization of a great Fleming novel that's true to the novel, but also contemporary how they pulled that off was a miracle and it works where would you put specter in the continuum of the daniel Craig? Movies? oh it, it's at the very bottom for me. <laughs> oh. um but that i mean honestly when you said that i was like wow like you would, you would i saw this, your face but yeah. you would put this above like skyfall oh yeah without a doubt i put okay. it above skyfall I, all right i don't i don't like the james bond in skyfall i i would rather be oh. the character of james bond in specter oh. than the character of james bond in skyfall Okay, that's an interesting point. All right, well, well defended, well argued. Uh, now we're going to round this thing up by getting out our burlap bags and bats and <laughs> smashing me in the head. So let's <laughs> let's go to my film, which will shock everyone. <laughs> okay, we are back, and we are. This is going to shock all of you. We're in front of Quantum of Solace, right? Back, yeah. Oh, look at that! They're they're learning so quickly. <laughs> Um, and I am here to defend Quantum of Solace, one that does not rate usually very high for people. I know for a myriad of reasons to which my brothers in arms will, I'm sure, regale you with. I will do my opening statement as usual. Um, so, and it, and it kind of gleans off of something that Kyle said. I tend to gravitate to movies where I love Bond in that movie. And that, that's the first thing I grapple with. Do I like Bond as Bond in this movie? And Bond is, as Ray has said, a deadly weapon. He is an assassin. He's a killer. He's heartless. He's cold. He has an economy of wor worms. Worms. It's like license to kill all <laughs> over again. He has, a, he has an economy of words. And because of that, he is just badass. This is how I usually describe the Daniel Craig in this film with Quantum of Solace. And this is a story... And I know they're going to get into all the negatives, so I'm not going to serve them on a platter for them. But this is a story where you really see Daniel Craig coming off of Casino Royale, where he had his new down and dirty moments, but now they're even grittier. They're even dirtier. And he himself is just a killer and cold. And I have to say, not even from an emulation standpoint, the style, the look, 
the locations, all those different things that I try to eat up in a Bond movie were there. And yes, I'm going to even go out on a limb and cause a lot of people pissed off, some of them in this room maybe. I like the story. I like the plot of water because it's not, as Ray said, an underground, even though there is an underground moment, an <laughs> underground <laughs> dwelling with a giant rocket or even world dominion. It's a real thing. There really were and are water battles mm -hmm. in the world. There are people like Dominic Green that, you know, are manipulators of people and government. So this was my way of creating a real world bond, but not like the license to kill real world bond, something that's still one foot in the fantasy and one foot in reality. And I think it serves it up very well. So I'll put on my helmet and <laughs> who wants to go first? <laughs> I'll go. Oh. <laughs> um, I am not a super fan of Quantum of Solace, and not for any of the reasons that you just said. I like James Bond in this movie. I like the use of water as the plot MacGuffin. I do think that that is a very contemporary global uh, geopolitical issue. But as a film with a capital F, I can't stand it. I The editing style, the hyper frenetic pace, the, the way it moves from just action scene to action scene to action scene with very little time for the story to breathe and unfold, it drives me nuts. Um, it's it's seizure-inducing, nausea-inducing frenzy, and I just, I don't like the style. So I'm going to mark you as undecided. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's right from Joe. That's like Pat and Pat. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> Wow. All right. Well, it's hard for me to argue, but I will talk about the editing a little bit. I I will say, because no, no Bond film is 100% perfect, mm -hmm. even Casino Royale. <gasps> yeah, yes. I know. Um, but I will say that this is the one area I've always said, I believe there is a quantum of solace out there that's two hours and 15 minutes long. And that's what I would like to see. I think the story needs to breathe a little, a little bit. The dialogue is clunky and we all know the story about the writer's strike. They didn't have enough time to finalize the script and it shows. Um, so a, a two hour cut with a little bit more room for the story to breathe and you know, hold the camera in place and just track the actors as they walk would, yeah. be, would be very helpful. The, the camera in place, I think they were absolutely very influenced as they often are by other movies out there and, and the Bourne obviously, yep. movies. You could see the action even following him from one balcony to the other, all those types of action scenes. Um, um, Bobby, who's the stunt guy from the film, who I interviewed, even said they had the same DP, they had the same action coordinator, mm -hmm. the same stunt people from the Bourne series. So there was a very specific purpose. The editing I can't defend, because as much as I have, <laughs> and I've watched this video, I've gone out there and said, yeah, but the opening shot with you know, the car scene, that's to make it feel like you're in a car accident. When you're in a car accident, mm. you don't know what way is that. That's just me. Like, it doesn't work for me. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's a beautiful looking movie. When I see stills from this film, I'm like, wow, that production design is spectacular. The clothing is wonderful. The coloring, the blocking is great. It's just the way it's pieced together as a moving picture I don't like. Are there any moments in the film, filmatically, or sections that you're like, it's really an enjoyable watch. You, you like the slate I, I like, hotel scene. That's a good scene, and I like the, the final shootout at the um, at the hotel in the desert at the end. Okay. I like that part. All right. Ray? I'm actually with you on this one. I enjoy it. I think uh, yeah. arguably the best opening title sequence for uh, Dana Craig's era with the car chase. I love that wow. car chase. Best dressed Daniel Craig movie. Yes. Uh, the action, some of the action scenes are fantastic. Uh, you, I mean, Green with the axe. Ah! Yeah, <laughs> he's a psychopath. He's a crazy yeah. guy. Yeah, uh, I, I enjoy it. Wow, and the, the editing oh. doesn't bother you. The story, uh, not so much. Like you said, you're coming off of the Bourne movies and everything, so every action movie that came out around then had had that influence in it. So it, it's just a part of the times for the film. All right, so I don't know if you can hear Joe cracking his knuckles, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Joe. Uh, I disagree with you guys. <laughs> oh, really? I'm a little Let's more in coming. Kyle's camp. Uh, yeah, don't really care too much for this. Although I, 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 I maybe that sounds harsher than I. It, it's you know, it's it's not a terrible watch, and like you said, because the visuals are very good, because the style is very good, 
Uh, the art direction is very good. Um, it makes it a, a watchable film. I totally agree. Uh, where the, I, I think the bigger, the, the biggest complaint I have with it is similar to what my complaint was in Spectre. It's, it's that very connect the dots type of storytelling where it's, it's just, we just need to get Bond from this scene to this scene, to this scene, to this scene. So you just do an action film, end it off with a clue. Do another thing, end it off with a clue. Do another thing, yeah. and it, and it, and things sort of drop in his lap. Sometimes, literally, uh, <laughs> the, the the next like just where he needs to go next, it'll just fall into his lap, and that's where he goes. Um, I do have a problem with the editing, uh, and it is it is frustrating. Like I think it's a good point that there is an hour, a two hours and fifteen minute film in here that was probably terrific. And, and interestingly. You mentioned the action style, you know, it, it was very very like Bourne and a lot of the other things that were happening at the time. What you don't get in here, thankfully, is shaky cam. You don't really get a whole right. lot of that. Mm -hmm. But the pro but but it was almost like but when they got to the editing bay, that, that that's where they goofed it up and said, Well we well we we didn't do the shaky cam thing, so we're gonna have to over edit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and that's where they, they, they really lose you. And and that is wildly frustrating because and, and I know we've talked about this before. You, you can't just arbitrarily edit those scenes because like no. it, you can't throw a chair to the left and then cut and then something happening off to the right. No, it plays you, with you, the mind. You need to, you, right, you need to choreograph these things if you're going to, to do that kind of editing style where, you, where your eye yeah. is where it needs to be. Um, so yeah, that, that I find very frustrating. Um, but again, is very redeemable in, in certain aspects. A lot of very good... Um, people in it, very good actors, very good performances. I, I think the action scene at the end is prob probably the best one. Mm. Um, so, yeah, but, but yeah, it's not gonna be very high on my I, I will say there's something very interesting going on here. Uh, and again, we, we work with these mathematics, but three out of the four of us have picked a very, what I call linear James Bond films. There's James Bond films, like From Russia With Love goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. So you see a lot of different characters, different places talking about different things and they, they weave it like that. Octopus is the same thing. You don't always see James Bond in every scene. You see things happening and he's a part of this bigger world, this world building. In Spectre, it's pretty much a linear story. In License to Kill, linear story. Quantum of Solace, it's a linear story and I think I sometimes like a, just a good, guilty pleasure James Bond linear story where I need my bolus of James Bond. Mm. You know, going back and forth, I can watch from Russia with Love, hell, even Octopussy, and get that bigger filmatic storytelling. But if I just want a pure bolus dose of James Bond, it's great. But I can't argue against the editing. Because one thing I've said is, when they have Mr. White, that must have been, if I got the raw film footage of that, you know with that guy, there was gold in there. And mm -hmm. even the chase scene yes. had to be absolute gold. And what they decided, what they, what Mark Forster and his editor decided to do is to say, let's play with everybody's minds and we're gonna make this seem so action and so fast and so frantic, it's going to be so exciting. But our minds can't handle that. I mean, even Chris Nolan's thousand that frames type of stuff. per second. Yeah, <laughs> so for his, his first Batman movie, he even talks about it. I saw this great interview where for his first Batman movie, he came up really close for the action. So you saw a shoulder and a fist move, but you didn't see the whole body. And for the next one, he pulled it back. And for the third one, he pulled it back even more. And he said it was more understandable about what was happening. And in this film, I think it gets a lot of dings because you're just like, where am I? Mm -hmm. No one wants to be confused. The other ding I will give it is this is the one. No, that's that, enough. <laughs> no, no. This, is, this is the one that the casual film goer forgot. Um, I think if you just talk Bond to the average movie fan who's not a Bond fanatic like us, they all remember Casino Royale. They all remember Skyfall. Skyfall. Yeah. The one that came between them. You're right. That one just did not click with the general public. It, it, and you said it. This is like the perfect example of a redheaded stepchild. To the point, I'll go one step further. I think Eon even said like, you know, let's kind of put this one in the corner. And being James Bond, not the Joe show, the, uh, the documentary, it got a little bit of lip service. Mm -hmm. But they even sort of insinuated like it has its issues. Still proud. But it's almost like, you know, the child that failed every grade and, oh, you know, we keep... We love we, him anyway. We keep Hugo in the attic and we give him yeah. raw meat every once a month. <laughs> but still love him. And he's alive. 
but mm-hmm. this feels like that. And I think, you know, I want to circle back to this because is this why we like or maybe even love the underdog films is because we feel like we're defending something? Totally. Uh, it, it's yeah. it's fun to be a fan of something that other people might not gravitate towards. No time to die. <laughs> or, uh, uh, I can't, just, I'm out. We're also <laughs> sitting in um, a spitting range. <laughs> Saying the spitting range of a view to a kill, which mm-hmm. a lot of people put on the bottom of their watchables, but I could, I could defend that one. You can, but yeah. I'm, I'm saying like people who love a view to a kill, they are absolutely passionate and vehement about that being a good film. There's 25 Bond films. There's favorites for everybody. There's something here that anyone can enjoy. Yeah, and. I think that people don't like bullies, and we like to defend against bullies, like Kyle. I agree with that. <laughs> All right, we're going to give everybody kind of uh, a little last. You know, if this was a jury trial, everybody gets a closing statement <laughs> on their film. Just kind of a synopsis. Uh, now that you've heard the dings and the defense, uh, Ray, we'll start with you. License to Kill. Why should these good folks give License to Kill one more try? Because it's Timothy Dalton. Timothy Dalton owns the role. Uh, he makes the movie. Um, flaws aside, he's fantastic in it. I like it. God, why should people on a rainy day like today, it's not, um, put on Spectre? Because it's a fun ride. You'll have a good time watching it. It's James Bond at his James Bondiest doing James Bond <laughs> things, and that's fun. It makes it rewatchable and enjoyable. Out of all the Charlie Brown, <laughs> you're the Charlie Brown. <laughs> all right, Joe, Octopussy, why? Why should they put it on? Uh, I, because it's got it all, and, and I would encourage anyone, if you haven't seen it in a while, if you sort of forgot about it, and if it's not very high on the list, if it's a little lower tier, give it another shot. Try to watch it with as fresh eyes as you can, because I, I think that it is a thrilling Right there it, it, again. Try to put yourself in, in in the shoes that you had the first time you saw it, and try to unravel the mystery. And and again, try to notice that there are so many typical Bond tropes that are that are in here that we don't really notice that are done really well. And 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 frankly, you might not notice it because it's just so harmonious with the story. Um, give it another shot. Curl up with a cocktail. I think you'll enjoy this Ooh, one. He's good. He actually created a setting. Um, and I'll just end it with uh, watch Quantum of Solace because you'll piss off other James Bond fans. <laughs> no, no. I'll, I'll say watch Quantum of Solace because um, he doesn't have a kid and he doesn't die in the end. There we go. Drink. Well, oh, that's right. Cheers. Cheers to all of you. Hmm. Now, here's, here's what you have an ability to do. What's your underdog? You have comments below. Tell us your underdog and give everybody a reason to watch your underdog film. In the meantime, this has been Joe and Rick and Kyle, and we will be back, probably dressed the same exact way. Who knows? <laughs> um, and, of course, David Zaritsky for the Bond experience, and we'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.